Hey everyone, uh, my name is Daniel Gataulin. I'm one of the senior research analysts uh, here in Chardon covering biotech. It is my pleasure uh, to introduce uh, George Laziske, uh, the CEO of ClearSide Biomedical, and Victor Chong, uh, the chief medical officer, uh, to our virtual ophthalmology summit, where the initial focus is on uh, wet AMD and diabetes related diseases. Uh, George, Victor, uh, thank you for joining. Uh, thank you for having us. Yeah. I really appreciate being part of the uh, the presentation and the conference today. Excellent. So, so let, let's take a few minutes uh, in the beginning, and uh, George and Victor, if you can briefly introduce yourself and then uh, clear your side to the audience and maybe highlight some of the recent milestones. Okay, sure. Um, I'm George Lazeski. I've been the CEO of ClearSide since 2019. My background is in clinical pharmacokinetics and in law. Um, I, I spent a considerable portion of my career at Allergan as the corporate uh, vice president for corporate development and strategy, and worked uh, since then up with a number of small companies. So uh, it's been my pleasure to be the CEO of ClearSide for the last five plus years. Uh, you know, at ClearSide, we have, uh, to, just to introduce the company, we have a singular focus on delivering on the potential of superchoroidal drug administration. We've pioneered superchoroidal delivery and are now the clear clinical and commercial leader in superchoroidal drug administration for ophthalmic disorders. We have a two-pronged strategy at the company. Uh, first, we focus on internally developing superchoroidal drug device combination products. The first one was approved in 2020, uh, 2022, was by the name of Zypir, was approved for the treatment of uveotic macular edema. And we have a second one in our pipeline now that's just completing a phase 2B trial, that's CLSA-X. It's tyrosine kinase inhibitor exidinib for the treatment of wet AMD. The second prong to our strategy is selectively partnering with companies that have capabilities and technologies that we don't possess, but they want to uh, access the superchoroidal space with our proprietary SCS microinjector because they believe that route of administration will give them some great advantages. And we have a number of partnerships. Aura Biosciences is our oncology partner. Uh, they're going after choroidal melanoma using superchoroidal uh, administration. Regenix Bio and their partner AbbVie are uh, pursuing wet AMD and diabetic uh, retinopathy with RGX314, the gene-based therapy from Regenix. We have a new partnership with BioCris Pharmaceuticals with an insoluble small molecule plasma calocrine inhibitor that they are focusing on diabetic macular edema. And as I mentioned, for our first approved product, Zypir, we have two commercialization partners. One, Bausch & Lomb, is commercializing Zypir for uveitic macular edema in the United States. And Arctic Vision is uh, finishing development and is slated to commercialize in the Asia Pacific region, principally uh, mainland China, Australia, and Singapore at the present time. In terms of near-term milestones for us, the most important one is CLSAX. We're completing the Odyssey Phase 2B trial uh, shortly, and we will have our top-line results uh, for uh, disclosure by the end of Q3 of this year. As I mentioned, Arctic Vision was doing a Phase 3 trial. They've just completed that Phase 3 trial and are applying for approval in China. And as I also mentioned, they also have pending approvals for their product, Zypir. They call it Arcadis in Australia and Singapore. Regenix Bio and AbbVie have just announced that they will use our SES microinjector to take RGX314 into phase three for diabetic retinopathy. And they're adding a set, uh, an additional cohort to their phase two trial with our SES microinjector in uh, wet uh, age-related macular degeneration. And finally, Aura Biosciences, our oncology partner, continues to enroll its global phase three program for the treatment of choroidal melanoma, again, exclusively using our SES microinjector. So those are kind of the, uh, the near-term milestones that are important to us and we think are value drivers for the company. Excellent, thank, thank you, George. And uh, Victor, if you uh, want, want to jump in and uh, spend a couple of minutes to introduce yourself. Yeah, so my name is Victor Chong, the Chief Medical Officer for ClearSci since um, March this year. Um, I'm a retinal specialist by training, uh, previously the head of department um, in uh, Oxford Eye Hospital in um, in, in the UK. 
And then um, during that time that I served as a uh, deputy chair for the steering committee for the idea development uh, way back. And uh, I joined Big Pharma in about 10 years ago that initially we bring the Ingelheim as, as the head of the medical head lead for the group over there. And in and then I moved to heading the group in Retina in J&J &J, uh, about three years ago. And so again, you know, have been um, doing big uh, job development uh, over the last 10 years. And I joined KSI um, about, uh, as I say, March uh, this year. Excellent. Thank, thank you. So, so let, let, let's jump in into um, into your programs and your your technology capabilities. Uh, so, the uh, supercritical space uh, microinjector, SCS microinjector, uh, obviously that's central to your company's model. Uh, could could you describe that injector in some more detail? Uh, how it works? What's unique about it? Uh, potential benefits. I, I know you alluded to a few. Um, and uh, may maybe uh, also mention what competitors are doing in the C uh, SCS space and what differentiates your uh, technology. George, you want to take that? Or... Yes. You no, I think you, you should. You, you okay. can take that. Yeah. So, yeah. so I think that um, in terms of our um, competitor in the supercritical space that I, I really don't think that there is any real competitor uh, from our perspective. I think that, you know, we have a product uh, already FDA approved. We have more than 10,000 injection. And, um, you know, I think that when we're looking at uh, others, uh, supercritical, uh, they are bad, they're mostly preclinical uh, or even if they were clinical, a very small number. And then some of the, um, uh, some of the other, people are using a mostly a preclinical uh, devices. And I think that, you know, if anything that when you mentioned about that is like, you know, when we hear about someone saying that, oh, that sometimes that when they're doing preclinical experiment, um, there is some inconsistency um, in giving in the supercritical space. And most of those are not using our injectors. And I think the reason of the inconsistency is actually that part of our magic about our our patent technology allow us to get into that space consistently. And so I think that was something that um, the community are getting grip on and uh, more and more uh, to understanding that, um, yes, you can do experiment in animal, but when you actually really go to human, I think that will be that we are really the leading, leading the, the, the field. And in terms of the delivery or how you compare, I think that, um, it is very similar to individual, but not the same. I think that is important. Um, we need, um, so I think um, that is also related to our recently uh, approved the CPT code. So uh, the reimbursement is about 10% more. So the CPT colleagues think that, you know, this is about 10% more complicated than individual, but not a lot more complicated. And you do need to do it a little bit slower and you take about 10 seconds longer. So I think those are the kind of feature that um, uh, are different. But the key is that this is an in-office procedure. You don't need a microscope. You can identify the space without seeing it. I think that is really where our patent technology make a hell of a lot of difference. Got it. And in, in terms of the patient experience, you, you mentioned that it similar to intravitreal approach and takes you know a few seconds longer uh any any other key differences in terms of patient experience uh, of the procedure yeah i think the patient experience is obviously uh where is a lot you know even for intravitreal injection people feel differently so i have patient that doesn't seem to feel anything and i have patient that uh were concerning about it and we do hear about some people uh, said that the procedure are more painful than individual injection. However, that we have seen that the experience might be different is because that uh, our current approval are on uveitic patient. And uveitic patient means that they have inflammation. And again, when you have an inflamed eye, then they tend to be more uncomfortable. And so far, our experience outside uh, our main indication in clinical trial, that doesn't seem to be a problem. So again, we are still early days. I think to be fair that the number of patients treating outside uh, inflammatory eye are still relatively small compared with overall number. But I think we believe that um, will be, um, you know, will be 
more understood as we go along. And certainly so far, our experience in non-inflammatory eye seems to be better. Got it. Okay, Make, makes sense. And uh, George, uh, you, you summarized a few partnerships already uh, that you've established over the past uh, few years. And uh, when, when uh, what, what are the limitations of the technology? I know some partners range from, uh, or in your use to, it ranges from small molecules to uh, gene therapies. Uh, what, what are the limitations of technologies? Uh, number one and number two, what, what do you look for when you look to partner uh, the microinjector? Well, it, a uh, couple of good questions there. Um, the limitations, I could uh, probably refer that to Victor in a moment, but it, from our perspective, we really focus on insoluble small molecules. These are things that are very difficult for other people to deliver. They've had to come up with extended release bio, uh, hydrogels. I mean, you, you can see Ocular has taken the same molecule that we have, oxidinib, and they have to mm -hmm. uh, put it inside a mesh hydrogel, allow that to deceive because it's it's insoluble. Otherwise, it would float around in the vitreous. We we like insoluble small molecules. We know how to formulate that for the suprachoroidal space. We inject it into this potential space, like Victor has said. The 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 the, uh, the, the drug sits in that space and it slowly dissolves and releases from that space. So we really like this insoluble small molecules. Uh, we, you can see from Aura Biosciences, they have a viral-like drug conjugate that they've uh, been able to formulate and put into the supracoidal space quite successfully. If you look at RGX314, the gene-based therapy from Regenix Bio, you know, that's an AAV vector-based uh, technology. The inflammation they get there is much less in the supracoidal space than they would see if, when they were injecting it into the, the vitreous or others have tried to go AAV vector um, administration into the vitreous. And there's been a lot of problems with inflammation. So we've, we've been able to handle gene-based therapy. We've been able to handle insoluble small molecules. Uh, the viral-like drug conjugate from Aura fits in there. The things that, the one limitation is if it's a highly water-soluble biologic or a highly water-soluble molecule, that tends to be swept away pretty quickly. So we really focus on those that are more difficult to formulate and inject into the vitreous are really the things that we look at and think these are great for us. So we have this ability to deal with stuff that's that's much more difficult to administer another way. And it's it, it there's benefits of administering it supercroidally. So it's, it's a nice marriage of difficult to deal with products, find their way to us. And then mm -hmm. we have a route of administration that works pretty well for them. Got it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Second part to your question, but I'll let Victor add to that if you don't mind. Yeah, so if there's some color to that, is like um, I think like George alluded to that there is a lot of potential molecule, small molecule that which uh, so called discontinuous, um, and also potential expectant, uh, because that they were just too insoluble to be systemically administered or have too much toxic effect. And so I think those are really perfect for us in a way. I think there's a low hanging fruit. I think that was really the 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 molecule that we would go after ourselves. But I get really excited about uh, what happened to our partner with the gene therapy. Uh, that um, you know, a lot all of us was surprised that it worked. I think to be honest, you know, and then, uh, but however, that you know, they're now going to phase three. And so it's um so here we can potentially that I, I did come from gene therapy development as well. So you know, if we can improve the capsule even further, um, that will be a, a big uh potential uh going going to that area. So I think that's exciting about that. And again, you know, biologic might be a little bit more difficult, but again, you know, we don't necessarily need to go to biologic, at least not in the near term. And um, but that could be another place that we can find solution to. However, that we do have some uh, experience uh, working with peptide already. So it, again, uh, peptide might be the next place that we want to go beyond what we've already been. Okay, got it. And, and, and Jerry, I think you wanted to add uh, to also in, in terms of uh, what, what you look for uh, in, in your potential partners. Uh, oh, okay, what we look for. Well, <clears throat> first of all, we look for somebody who appreciates and uh, the potential of the space, okay? That's number one. They tend to come to us rather than we going to them. Uh, we, um, we're we looking for companies, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, that it's a very strategic 
decision on our part whether to partner with somebody because what we don't want to do is we don't want to partner away all the disease states and all the approaches to treating retinal diseases. So our, our licenses are usually, when we do that, very narrowly crafted to, to have a very narrow field. And it's a field that we don't believe that now or in the near term, we have the abilities to compete in. Uh, for example, mm -hmm. uh, oribosances was an easy deal to do. They had this vi viral-like drug conjugate going after a cancer uh, indication. That was something that was never on uh, our radar screen, and we weren't going to do it and didn't have that capability to do it. And they've since expanded into bladder cancer as well. So they're a cancer company. So that was an easy one. Regenix was a, a little bit more difficult, but at the time and, and for the foreseeable future, we don't see ourselves as an AAV vector based company. Now that may change over time, but our, our license with them is AAV, but for a, a select narrow indication, for example, wet A&D or diabetic retinopathy. That's, that's basically the license. The geographic atrophy is wide open for us. And so we, we've kept that uh, away. And then and in the case of like Biochrist, <clears throat> That was a molecule that we were not going to proceed uh, proceed with, and they wanted to, and we didn't see it as uh, competitive uh, at all with us. And so we were happy to help uh, Biotris formulate that and move that forward. If you look at the partners, I mean, uh, Zypir was going to was not going to be a huge product, has a very narrow indication, so it didn't make sense for us to create an infrastructure, sales infrastructure around that. So we found a partner in Bausch. And obviously, we weren't going to sell that product and develop it in China. And we were happy to find a partner that was willing to do that for us. So we're taking very strategic approach to partnerships. The, 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 the rights that are granted are very narrow. And they're keeping a lot of options open for ClearSide to de develop additional products across the board in retinal disorders. Got it. Excellent. Yeah, I look forward to, to seeing the updates in the coming months and years uh, as, as uh, you're thinking about expanding your pipeline. Sure. Uh, so so, so let, let's switch the gears and uh, talk about your your lead program, uh, CLS AX, uh, currently uh, in development for WebMD. Uh, so we talked about the injector component already. Uh, can you talk about the, the molecule itself, Exitinib? Um, what gives it um, potential advantage uh, over other TKIs and, uh, you know, what does it add into uh, anti-VGF space? Yeah, I think that if you look at Acetinib as a TKI, I think what, when you think about wet AMD, the most important is the anti-VEGF component. So VEGF have three different types of receptor. There's a little bit of difference about, uh, you know, uh, which biologic hitting which receptor. But again, you know, uh, Acetinib hit all three of them and all hit three of them with a very low IC50. Being a low IC50 means that you got much more potent. In other words, that you got smaller, small amount of drug can uh, continue to work. And I think that, you know, to a certain extent that what we are really looking for is to extending the duration. And by extending the duration that, um, you know, so if you got able to work on a lower concentration, then you have a longer duration. So I think that was really the key advantage of a Citizenab comparing with other TKI. Okay. And uh, so, so I think another uh, point about Exitinib is its uh, potency, right, compared to, to other uh, TKIs. It's a, it's a more potent inhibitor. Uh, and, and the question is, uh, do, do you need uh, that extra potency? Uh, do, is there, you know, potential drawback uh, of introducing toxicity or are you able to control that with the dose uh, can, can you comment on that yeah so i think that um the uh, understanding is that the if you have lower potency then you would need uh, they, they won't, won't last as long or you need to have a bigger uh, of a higher dose i think that is the kind of the reality that uh, from that perspective and acetinib have been used as a systemic therapy for uh, long for many different kind of I think for many thousands of patients for oncology, and uh, ocular side effect is not really seen as an issue. So again, the difference for us is being a local delivery. Then we don't think that oh, that's the same advantage that like anti VEGF that if given systemically and uh, have a lot of potential side effect, but giving individually that the systemic adverse event rate is very low. So I think we see those advantages. 
And that's why the local delivery is important. And even comparing to in vitro that George alluded to earlier that uh, it sits in a, uh, with superchoroidal, we only actually get the drug to the back of the eye. And we don't even have good, uh, the exposure to the front of the eye is minimal. So again, then we have already seen that in our steroid uh, product that uh, we don't have as much IOP rise and cataract. Now, uh, people would say that we don't know uh, TTI, if you give it intravitrally, whether that will cause problem or not. And you might not, but at least that in our case, that would be even more restricted to the coral and retina, uh, which is where the drug has to be. So that compartmentalization uh, are advantageous over even other TKI, uh, uh, even other methodology of giving uh, acetonab. Got it. Okay. And and from from your own experience, so you you've run uh, you've completed a phase one uh, two A study already. Uh, you've you shared some data. Uh, can can you summarize uh, the key uh, key findings there? Yeah, I think that the phase one study is relatively small. It's also a dose uh, escalation study, and we've uh, uh, identified that the top dose, one milligram, are uh, still very safe. So we chose that to move into our uh, 2B study. We have seen that in a patient group, that being a phase one study, a lot of patients in that study had a very high demand before the treatment. And even then, a two third does not need any additional therapy up to six months. So I think that we see that as a potential positive sign. And, um, and again, um, uh, we um, uh, those are the two key features, I think, that the lack of um, adverse event and also two third get to six months um, in a very highly active population. And then that's that when we move to our phase two study. Okay, got it. And so so your, your two, uh, phase two or phase two B study is ongoing now, as uh, George mentioned, uh, you, you have uh, data readout coming out at the end of third quarter. Uh, so let, let's, let's talk about that study. Uh, can you talk about the design, the size, and uh, maybe some of the key findings from the phase one, uh, you know, besides the dose regimen that, that you selected uh, that, that you think would make uh, the probability of success of the 2B uh, higher? Yeah, so I think that we were trying to learn from uh, our competitor um, as well. And also that when we hear about criticism of some of the other people's phase two study, and then so what, what we have learned from them. So number one is that, um, uh, some people concerned that some of the patient that uh, in some of our competitors phase two study that the patient the patient is already pretty well treated and uh, is very little uh, disease and therefore that they can last longer with no treatment and we do see that uh, in some of the like year three patient that um, they can go quite long with no treatment so so we take our approach is number one that we tend to enroll people that are still toward a uh, year one patient and there's a tendency that we want to do and also that we want to um, look at patients that have to have active disease so and also the active disease are considered by the reading center so it's not really just the investigator uh, thought that is active disease but it was um, met by the reading center and I think that those two would allow us to at least explain our data set that when we come out, and as you say that, um, you know, in uh, in the next couple of months, that uh, we would have a, a bunch of patients that we think we need to be treated and still kind of toward year one and uh, maybe the beginning of year two. And so I think that was the kind of direction that we think that our population uh, would be physician think that that they would still need to be have active treatment. So that's one thing that we uh, think that uh, our data will be helpful uh, for physicians to understand, um, you know, our result. And again, you know, some people will say that um, our result might look worse um, because of that. But again, you know, our, I think that our retinal specialists are very smart in understanding baseline characteristic um, is something that um, they, can, they can dissect the data. And the second part is also very important is that in our competitor that a lot of people say that well they have never really retreated with their own drug and uh, and then they move to phase three. 
And again, well, AMD is a, a multi, you know, is, you really need to treat the patient for a very long time. And if you only do one treatment, you don't know what happened uh, when you retreat. So to us is that we did sacrifice a little bit about that. We would not know that whether on our drug on, on its own, whether it will lo last longer than six months or not. However, that, you know, um, we, every patient that if they were doing well, uh, um, then they can actually be able to retreat them at uh, uh, six months. And that will give us a uh, data that, you know, when we retreat, what will happen? And also that we follow them up for another three months to uh, week 36, which is where the phase three trial uh, tend to land uh, as the primary endpoint. So I think that our phase mm -hmm. two are providing the additional and important data that when we redose our drug and what will happen, and then we can learn from that on our on our phase three study and then how to handle um, that um, uh, that idea. And then finally, that um, uh, we think that our future uh, when we when when we are into the market that uh, we whether that we will have the flexibility uh, similar to biologic. And one of the flexibility of biologic is that you can redose earlier with their own drug and we don't need to rescue by another drug. So again, then we were looking into that um, in our phase two study, we already allow similar situation that we can redose earlier uh, as part of the program. So all these things will help us to understanding how do we design a phase three study and our current goal for our phase three study is to allow us to be able to adjust those things uh, and also that um, able to have the flexibility for physician uh, to go to between every three to six months. Okay, got it. I understand. So, so ju just to make sure that I am um, getting the, uh, the dosing cor correct, uh, dosing regimen correct the the baseline assumption is the six months right uh, they're redosing at six months for all patients unless they've met uh, the retreatment criteria and they received the dose sometime before um, correct so even right. but even if they did not meet the retreatment criteria at six months they would still uh, undergo a mandatory uh, retreatment at six months correct okay Got it. Um, and uh, my understanding is that all patients in, in the study have uh, completed uh, that six month treatment already and uh, they've re been retreated, correct? Correct. Okay, excellent. Um, okay, in, in terms of uh, the retreatment criteria, I think that seems to be uh, one, one point of uh, inconsistency, uh, I guess, between uh, different trials and even within trials as uh, some specialists have their own uh, criteria, uh, so, so to speak. Uh, and even when, when formal criteria are not met, some specialists uh, still choose to do retreatment. What, what has your experience been and what, what are you doing to uh, make these criteria more consistent? Um, so retreatment criteria in clinical trial studied it specifically and I think that you know certainly for our phase two study uh, we will look at those who meet the criteria but then end of the day that um, you know the, the, the decision to retreat are uh, investigator driven so so I think that will be something that we'll look into when we present our result and I think that you know whether that um, I think that there were some uh, some of our KOL uh, told us that, you know, even uh, Ali High Dose Rizumab and some of our competitors in TKI world, that the rescue criteria they use or the dose adjustment criteria they use are not what they do in their clinical practice. Now, again, obviously at the moment that for comparison purpose, our phase two are quite similar to those uh, criteria that, that that those company and product that I mentioned. Now, with the phase three, we will adjust that. Is something that we wait to be seen. I see. Okay, got it. So, so with, with the data coming up in the next um, couple couple of months, uh, what what should we paying what should we be paying particular attention to? And from from your standpoint, what would you consider a home run? 
Yeah, so I think the first thing is uh, AE. Is that, uh, I think that ocular safety is very important in this particular uh, area. And we've seen that a small amount of safety issue already leading to uh, a product not being successful. So I think that uh, no ocular uh, SAE drug related uh, is important. And I think so far, so good for us. Um, um, we expect that similar to our um, uh, phase one, two result, that majority by far, you know, we can get to six months. Um, they will have the mandatory retreatment, but so that um, we would expect that would be the case. And then we'll be really holding the BCVA and CST, uh, the OCT finding and the vision uh, to maintain a similar result uh, all the way to week 36. This is where we, um, our, our uh, end point would be. Okay, got it. And, um, you know, assuming that uh, this readout is successful and then uh, followed by successful uh, phase three program, how, how do you see uh, CLS AX being used um, in the long run at, at a steady state? So once patients been loaded and uh, have received your drug and uh, where, where do you see it being used with anti-VGFs? Yeah, so I think that, you know, the way that we are thinking about it is that in a few years time that in terms of revenue, uh, Ferisimab and Idea High Dose might be the market leader at that time. And but we have the advantage uh, compared to other TKI that we, we can redose uh, with our own drug. So we will be competing in that market, that space that um, uh, like similar to what like today that Ferisimab and Idea High Dose will be replacing Idea. Um, in a true and extend fashion in clinical practice. And we believe that we were lasting longer than uh, both for SML and early high dose, and we'll be replacing them uh, in a true and extend fashion. Because our advantage is unlike other TKI uh, that uh, they need rescue in, uh, by ILEA in between their treatment. So, so again, um, that is something that uh, we don't have to do. Uh, we would have the advantage uh, over uh, other TKI. So we do have the advantage of being lasting longer, but also have the flexibility like the biologic. Got it. Okay. Um, all right. I, um, and I, are you sharing any plans for you for a potential future phase three program? Are you waiting uh, to share these results first before you provide any guidance? Yeah, so we are planning to uh, share that with our top line result. So obviously we are thinking a lot of different um, phase three design right now. And we also taking uh, op uh, taking a meeting with the agency. And But I think that what uh, when we actually see our result, learning from our phase two, and then we can mm -hmm. uh, home down uh, to a draft um, uh, result, a draft phase three design. Got it, fair. Okay. And um, I, I I see we're running out of time, and uh, you know just a couple of household uh, questions. Uh, if you can summarize where the company is in terms of cash position and the runway, and what assumptions go into that. Sure. Uh, yeah. At at the end of uh, Q two, we had twenty nine million in cash and cash equivalents. Uh, that runway takes us into Q three of twenty twenty five. Uh, that assumes uh, that business continues to be uh, the way it, where we're running the business. No change in that. And uh, a little bit of phase three planning. It does not include uh, full phase three uh, costs. Okay. That, that's, uh, that's not in that plan. But, but right now, $29 million as of Q2, end of Q2, and uh, runway into Q3 of next year. Okay. Got it. Okay. And one, one last question to kind of bring it all together, um, maybe in a couple of sentences. Uh, what, what do you guys think uh, investors might still be missing about ClearSight's story? Well, I think from, from my perspective, I think they're beginning to gain a better appreciation, hopefully a, a better appreciation of the future potential of supercroidal drug delivery for the treatment of retinal disorders. Uh, that that potential is increasingly being recognized and it's gaining momentum in the retinal community itself. And that's due not only to our development of Zypir as our first product, but our continued development of CLSAX, but also a lot of activity in the retinal community and the academic world that show that there's great potential for the administration of gene therapy in the suprachoroidal space and the treatment, a more direct approach to the treatment of geographic atrophy through the, the supercroidal space. 
So I think uh, hopefully they, they, uh, the, the investors begin to increasingly appreciate that potential. Uh, that's value uh, creation for us. We're clearly the leader, as Victor said before, uh, we've got uh, over 10,000 clinical and commercial injections. Our SES microinjector is safe, reliable, uh, well-tolerated. We've got a, a strong supply chain, ISO certified manufacturing and supply of our injector platform for the SES microinjector. And, uh, you know, so we've developed one product. We know how to get the drug device combo through the agency. We've got a second product on the way and we're having success with our partnerships. So, you know, these are really exciting times for the company. Uh, hopefully uh, when we reveal our data, it'd be well accepted, but it, clearly the future, there's there's a, a bright future for supercoital drug delivery uh, that's being uh, well recognized inside the ophthalmic and retinal communities. So it's a good, it's a good time to be, it's a good time to be a clear site. That's the way we look at it. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, George, Victor, uh, again, I uh, really appreciate your time and uh, sure. look forward to, to staying in touch. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Dan. Thank you.